Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm doing an unboxing and rambling around Epic Seven Arise, the board game. It's an app, it's an app, the whole thing's an app. I don't know anything about it, I've never played the app, but it's a... There's a word for this. A gotcha? Gotcha game? Is that what it's called? I'm not, I'm not overly familiar, I've heard the term before. This is Epic Seven Arise, currently put out by... Jo oh, oh, Tom, of course, the coffee and knife and all that stuff. This is Epic Seven Arise, uh, put out by Japanime Games, but originally from... Farside Games, I think that's who it's from, and if you're like, that's not new, that shrinks broken, I blame my Discord community for that. Or more specifically, Meg, I blame Meg for that. Basically, I have this, I don't even know why I have this, oh, that's why. I was doing a Origins recap with our Discord community, and at one point I was like, oh, by the way, this is something that I didn't actually get at Origins, but I got a brief demo at Origins, and so I kind of counted it, it showed up while I was gone, so I got it while I was at Origins, and I got the demo while I was at Origins, so like, it all counted. And uh, Meg's like, oh, go ahead and open up for one. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I currently plan on unboxing it. And she's like, well, the problem is if you don't do that, if you, like, what was the, what was the phrasing? The phrasing was like, don't you care enough about our Discord community to, to show them first? And that's guilt. And I'll lean into the guilt. So I grabbed my knife and I started slicing. And then I was like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. And so I held off. But I got best of both worlds. I got to show people that I cared and still do the unboxing. But I, I mean, I said very clearly, I said, if I unbox it now, I'm not unboxing it after. It's one or the other coffee. I genuinely, I genuinely time these unboxings around my coffee breaks. My coffee breaks are usually nine in the morning. That's not true. That's a lie. Blatant, bold faced lie. When I wake up, as soon as I wake up, whenever that is, uh, add 10 minutes to like get out of bed and get prepped. Then I have coffee. That's anywhere between 7 a.m. all the way up to like 8.30, depending on how late I went, but late I went to bed the night before. And then 4 p.m. ish, although it's currently six. The 4 p.m. one is usually pretty accurate. Usually around 4 p.m. I have an afternoon coffee. I've been doing that for a long time, although it has varied over the years. Uh, way back in the day, uh, once upon a time, this is Epic Seven Arise, let's open this up, let's go through this, let's talk about things, the ba the good, the bad, the ugly, and this, I mean, we've got miniatures, the miniatures look cool, we got our rule book here, and is it or is it not cooperative? I'm not even clear on that. I know I got a demo of it, but I don't know if that was clear to me. We got this over here, this uh, cover over here. Anyways, what was, the, what was the thing about coffee? Uh, way back in the day, we got a fly down here. Yay. Way back in the day, I had a job that, uh, when I first, my first job, I got home at four. I would leave at like eight and get home at four, and so I had my co afternoon coffee at four. Then later, I had a job that got me home at five. I didn't love that. My afternoon coffee shifted to five. I made do with what I could. And then at one point, I was getting home at six or even 6.30. My afternoon coffee was still when I got home. Didn't love that, just because I like the coffee earlier. I like having it earlier. It's just nice to have. And then when I started working from home, or, you know, doing the whole YouTube thing, and then the game found thing, that completely changed how I interact with coffee, and now I just have coffee whenever I want. Which is usually around 4, but also sometimes around 6. Why do I do the coffee specifically with the unboxings, when inherently I have to then pause to drink, which interrupts the flow of the video? Well, first of all, I talk so fast, it's really the only room you have to breathe anyway. And secondly, it's because it's become a thing at this point, so, like, I have to lean into it now. It's too late to undo it. Let's go ahead and go through this. This is Epic Seven Arise, and I'm not clear if it's cooperative or not because of a variety of factors, but let's, let's start with the rule book and get a sense of that. Uh, I believe there might... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's, there is a thing... I was watching a... Um, the demo I got made it seem like it was cooperative. Do you have anything on this first page, or this is the first page? That's a, that's a thick cover. Okay. We got over here, we got our miniatures, our components, our rules are going to start. Setup is over here, is on page... Five, there are page numbers. I got worried for a second. We got our version set up, one to three player setup over here. And there's a difference over here as far as, um, da, 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 nope, not this. There's something else. There's something else over here. Okay. We have over here each chapter has its own unique story. If that happens, okay. Each chapter has its own unique events and objectives, which everyone should work together to complete. If that happens, however, only the individual player with the highest score is the ultimate winner. Therefore, in order to win, you can spend your resources sparingly while ensuring that your team is strong enough to deal with the enemies. I feel bad. You see, this copy was sent to me to review, and in general, in general, when I review things, I specifically try to take on things that I'm actively interested in. I just read that this is semi-co-op. That's what I just read. This is semi-co-op. Now, I will grant I have to play it first, but I feel bad because if I knew this was semi-co-op, I would not take this on. I would not have taken this to review. Anyways, I mean, we'll still find out how it is. But I was, I was interested. I remember the Kickstarter campaign. I remember the Kickstarter campaign. I mentioned the concept of it, but that sounds like semi-co-op. If it's balanced around semi-co-op, because there's, there's two ways this works. Either you, it's actually a challenge to win, in which case you can just call cooperative and who cares who wins. That's what, that would be my preference. I want it to be an actual challenge and just have a wins who wins. Alternatively, 
it actually actively is semi-co-op and that could be a problem depending on how it's done. We'll reserve judgment, actual judgment until I play it, but I'm definitely a little nervous now. So page six is where the rules start and they don't seem to be that long. I already have a general sense of the gameplay. The receiving damage and counter missions, movement phase, game end. We go all the way to page 15. That's not bad at all as far as the game length. So game length looks very, very accessible. I already watched a, um, a skim through a review that seemed to be fairly concerned about the semi-co-op aspects, which is why I wasn't sure if it was semi-co-op. And I wasn't sure if there's a Kickstarter to retail conversation there, because I know this was a Kickstarter game, and then Japanime, you know, helped with retail and did all that stuff. We have our characters here, by the way. The Sword of the Flowers. Let's see if this is zoomed in perfectly. Perfect. So we have the Sword of Flowers over here. We have Victory and Honor are always mine. That's not, that's, that's their, I'm sorry. Their names are actually Aziria, and Krau, and Mercedes, and Yuna, and Destina. And we have Dark Corvus. Dark Corvus, yeah, Luna, and Rasa, and Raz, and Azuria. And this is a whole different conversation around the nature of different art styles, and specifically anime art styles, which is not as much my jam. This is an issue with... I mean, well, this fits into Japanime's wheelhouse, I'll give that. But this is an issue for me with games like Madara, Kingdom Death Monster, uh, Epic Seven, Arise, and then anything, you know, Tante Curie, all those games. When you have a certain specific anime style... It's not my personal jam. Now, if I like the game, and if it's not too over the top, I can get past it. So, like, this is in a genre where if I like the game, I'll deal with it. I don't care. Madara is one where I'm semi-concerned about it, but if I like the game, I'll deal with it. I don't care. Versus, I don't know, what's another example or option? I don't have a specific example option. But, yeah, that's that's kind of the, the basic idea as far as... If I like the game, I'll deal with it, but it's not my go-to. Now, we have a bunch of miniatures here, which are going to be fun to go into. We got our bosses, our enemy bosses here, which we'll open up soon enough. We have our other trays full of miniatures, which, again, we'll open. We save these for last in the unboxings, always, because we all know they're the most interesting thing. And that means if you are willing to use the timestamps, you can jump straight to them. And if you're too lazy to use the timestamps, then, ha, I tricked you. And now we're going to have to watch, you're going to have to watch it. This is, this is interesting as far as the um, assembly of how this all goes. Like, this is an interesting component. It kind of holds these in place. I'm not even necessarily averse to it. I just find it interesting. Then we have our punch boards, which is going to be coming out any second now. There we go. Punch boards, which means we can go ahead and look at those in a second. I feel like I was on a train of thought. It was coffee. It was my jobs. I don't know exactly what it was. But let's go ahead and open up some stuff over here. We got our punch. Let's do punch boards or... Let's do punch boards first. So, we have these punch boards here. These are going to be the various locations. You're going to be putting them on the board in different ways and then have little tokens, I believe, in between them. I think. I think. There's going to be like, you're going to be moving around from tile to tile. You're going to be engaging with various enemies. You're going to be, have to be mindful of the damage on a spot. You can't see it well, but I'll show it to you in a second. Here, if I do it like this. If you see over here, you'll see those numbers here. That represents the enemies attacking. So a four has a lower chance of being hit than a five or six or a two or three right now, just because of the distribution of numbers and the one over there. So you're trying to be mindful of where you stand to not die. That goes back to the whole semi co aspect where you're trying to be mindful of not dying while also wanting a specific single winner who killed the people the most, which I am mindful of. I'm not saying it's the worst. I'm saying I'm very mindful of it. We have the enemy attack card over here, this enemy card. And I'm unboxing this now, by the way. These I'll punch out later. That seems like, you know what? No, I'm going to punch it out now. In fact, I'll punch it out now while also talking about our sponsor of today's video, which if you've been watching our unboxings in the past, our unboxings the past few months have generally been sponsored by One Sharp Joe. One Sharp Joe, who does these component holders as well as a variety of other things. But in this particular episode, we're talking about the component holders because that's going to be useful to being able to uh, put these components in different configurations and stuff. In fact, this actually... This is for cards. I guess we'll keep this out. We'll leave this off the side. These are going to be component holders from One Sharp Joe. One Sharp Joe, where I'll have a link down below, as well as a coupon code, so you can go ahead and use, I believe it's board game code 10, but I'll link to it down below, to get any number of things off. They do inserts, they do Marvel United inserts, they do Marvel Champions inserts, they do Arkham Horror inserts, and Dominion inserts, and tons and tons of inserts, and they also do these component trays over here, where you can put things down into the trays, all, all held together by magnets. They, they hold nicely. They don't actually drop. It's the way I was holding it that thing causes drop there. But we're going to go ahead and use this to put our tokens down as we go. But anyways, yeah, One Sharp Joe, sponsor the video. I appreciate, uh, thanks to One Sharp Joe for sponsoring this video. And you can use these component holders and all those fun things as you will. Uh, I use his products all the time. I'm genuinely a fan of his stuff. I've been using him, I've been, I've been using his stuff for, I want to say, two years now. And he's been a sponsor for the past several months. And we're going to use these to punch out these tokens. But with that, back to what I was saying a second ago. What was I saying a second ago? That's the problem with this. You're losing your train of thought. So I'm interested by the game, and I hopefully will dive into it 
probably over the weekend. Uh, the downside is apparently it cannot be played solo. What's the player count in this? I mean, it's a semi-co-op. You definitely can't play it solo unless you're two-handing it, which I don't like to do. I don't mind two-handing an actual solo game. I mean, if you have a cooperative, full cooperative experience, two-handing it doesn't bother me at all. I, I like it often. But semi-co-op, you just can't have that experience. So now my next question is, what player counts does it reasonably tolerate? Ooh, we have gems. We could do gems over here. So, we have different gems here. Three different colors, too. We have three different colors of gems. I don't know if this is a specific type for them over here, but the whole reason, I think I was saying that the whole reason I was unboxing this today is specifically because... How do I want to organize this? I'm going to swap this over here. We're going to put that there and swap this around over here. Move that out here. You also, by the way, can get laser printing, too. That way, if I have these here, but I want to have these here because I want to be able to sort them from color. Why am I doing it that way? Just because, why not? But I specifically wanted to table it this past weekend, this weekend. And so in order to do so, the game has to be unboxed, which means I have to do this video. I don't have to do this video. I can do whatever it is I want. In fact, this isn't even an all-in. This is a regular retail edition of the game. And this is a game that had a full Kickstarter all-in and everything. Although, from what I've heard, it was a mixed experience. Uh, lots of... Lots of decisions were made around quality and, at least I'm doing ministers last, around quality and around what stress goals were included and number of dice and things like that in the game. This is going to be like a thing that can go in between tiles as well to give you some sense of adventure in some way. I don't know exactly what this does, but I know there are cards. Oh, this is not even on camera, I'm realizing. There we go. Now it's sort of on camera as we link those together over there. I'm gonna, I shouldn't be punching this out. I should not. I do want one of these because I want to see how these hold up based on something else I saw. I'm gonna I'm just I, I did not mean to punch stuff out here. I think we're gonna make this the last bunch of stuff. No, we're gonna punch out the wounds too. We're gonna punch out these wounds and then stop punching because this really is not supposed to be a punching thing. I don't like organizing while doing unboxings. I like unboxings while doing unboxings and organizing later, unless there are exceptions. Like there are times I, I recently did an Everdell. Everdell all in unboxing. Uh, like all in, the whole collector's edition, complete edition, whatever it is, I never really unboxed that, and so I finally dove into that, and that ended up being a entirely focused on organizing stuff, and not at all focused on the actual uh, gameplay. Anyways, let's grab one of these larger ones, and one of these mid-sized ones, so we have those for a little test I'll be doing shortly. Past that, we have our story card board over here, which again, we'll be going into soon, and then we have more of these terrain tiles, which I'm going to open it up and look at. The game seems to have you just wandering around terrain tiles, fighting monsters, trying to get the killing blow. That's the thing. So this game has a few things that have me nervous that I did not know about when I said yes to covering it. Which, the first thing, I'm still interested. The miniatures look great, and it might be fun. It could be a simple, fun time. But I am... Also, the art style is a factor, which is I have to like the game a draw more than the average game because the art style, it's a factor for me. It's a, it's a factor in terms of how much I enjoy something. But anyways, I mean, I think it looks great. It's just that... Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Anyways, uh, the killing blow aspect. I am a, I am not a fan of the killing blow mechanic in games where a single player gets the death blow and benefits from it. Now, in cooperative, who really cares? So, for example, a game like Townsfolk Tussle is interesting. I don't know if you've played Townsfolk Tussle, but it has this aspect where you kind of are on the same team, but also there is, like, a sheriff person who's in charge. But the way Townsfolk Tussle ultimately plays... Ultimately, it plays like you are on the same team, and you are working together, and you're accomplishing goals, and then there's a degree of slapstick humor. Like, I slap the constant example I give, because it's an actual card, is I take a piece of dynamite, I slap it to your leg, and send you off into the uh, baddie that you're fighting against. Not the baddie, the uh, ruffian. The ruffian that you're... I think it's called ruffian. I think so. Whatever it is you're fighting against, you, you get a little slap, a stick of dynamite slapped to your leg and sent off to fight the boss, and then you blow up in his face, and you take some damage, he takes some damage, and it's all around a good time. That's slapstick humor. As opposed to, hey, I'm not going to kill this guy because I don't want to hurt him because then it makes your final blow easier. But then if we don't kill him together, we all lose. But if I help him, then ultimately you'll get the killing blow too and you'll win. So that's a little harder. Like a game that had a tricky time, Horizon Zero Dawn was a tricky time with that. Horizon Zero Dawn was an interesting game in the sense that Horizon, though, I have a little bit of leeway to because I still have Horizon Zero Dawn for now. I don't think it stays forever. Too many boxes. But here's some art in the tiles. Like I do like the visual aesthetic of these tiles. The problem I had with Horizon Zero Dawn, or the reason I, I'm okay with Horizon Zero Dawn, is because in Horizon Zero Dawn, if you're playing it purely cooperatively, it's too easy. And if you're playing it semi-cooperatively, there's times where it feels like the way you're playing is not, not thematic. Like, there's times where you're like, I'm gonna let you die. But as long as you're willing to play, if you're willing to play Horizon Zero Dawn thematically, as opposed to mechanically, then it works. 
Meaning if you do treat it as, well, I'm the winner or you're the winner, but you don't choose to engage in decisions that would be thematically weird for people who are in the same tribe, then it really does work. And I can get behind that. Meaning I can critique it and I can understand and buy into why someone would have an issue with it, but I can also get behind it at the same time. These, these styles, by the way, the art's great here. So if this has the same idea, if this does have that thematic tie-in, sure, I can deal with that. But Killing Blow, Killing Blow is a big deal for me. I do not like Killing Blow. I never have. Arcadia Quest had it. I hated it there. Uh, there's a series by Martin Wallace that I always forget the name. Hated it there. Uh, we had Ignite. Was not a fan of it in Ignite either. One of the recent games. Oh my gosh, Final Strike. There's a game. I actually kind of like Final Strike. I kind of like it despite myself. Final Strike was a game that literally the entire game is named Final Strike because the person who gets the Final Strike gets the most reward. Now, you do get reward for hitting along the way. So that's one benefit. So you do get reward. It's just, it's so, so little compared to the Final Strike. There are reasons why Final Strike bothered me less. One of those reasons is because you do get rewards along the way. The other reason is because... There is, especially the a two-player game. Final Strike as a two-player game, I think, works well because you really feel like I have to go back and forth between you and me and there's a time mechanism. As a three or four, it kind of feels victim to what can happen along the way. Anyways, let's open these packs here. Do I want to open these packs? This is episode one. Do I want to open that? I think it's just tokens for the episode. I will open episode one just so you can get a sense of what's in here. But I'm not going to open up all the episodes because I think these are specifically for, you know, there's eight episodes here. And if you like the six boxes, you're right. But there's chapters two and three, three and four combined, and chapters six and seven combined. Honestly, I like the system. This is a system using Cthulhu that's my die. I like it. I think it's fun. It gives that episode of uh, the, the episodes you have. So we have these tokens over here. We have the settings and special rules around the episode, which means in addition to the regular rules, you also have to read this pamphlet in terms of whatever's going on as far as the episode breakdown, which is not a big deal. That's not a lot. We have some more standees over here to deal with. And then we have a bunch of cards, which let's go ahead and open up these cards and figure out how these operate. Whoa, we have a bunch of cards. Are these story one? What are these? We've got our Arbiter Vildred over here. We have our enemies you're fighting, fighting off against over here. These are cute. I like them. I mean, they're going to kill you, but they are cute. We have over here, we have these, 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 and then we have our episode cards, epilogues. So it looks like this is going to be the first card. We have the Search for Arky. Two decades later, no, I won't win for you. I mean, I don't think it's winning. It's literally the first episode, but just in case, I'll give you the agency to decide if that's something that you want to uh, see. And by agency, I mean you can read your own stuff because I can't really ask you your opinion how you want me to handle things now. So that's episode one. We're not going to open the episode, we're not going to open the rest of the episode boxes in order to maintain the illusion of magic over here. We have standees for all our standees over here. We have our dice for all our dice. These are just dice. I mean, they're little pink and green dice. Oh, I think that was that was one of the things. There's supposed to be four dice, and there's only two. We have our little meeples over here, which we're not going to deal with. We have our cards, which we will look into cards. Now, there is a bit of a combo slash chaining system in this game, where you are, if I recall correctly, red cards let you combo into things more. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's blue cards. Maybe it's blue cards let you combo more. I don't remember exactly. But there's cards that let you combo in different ways. We have these over here, which are, I guess, skill cards for different characters. Ancient Dragons, return three skill point cards from your action area to player's hands. Sword of Ezra, play this card when under attacked, ignoring all damage. Celestine, heal three HP to all. This is a semi... I don't know. I don't know. I have to play the game. I have to play that. But the idea, if there's a character who's like, I deal six extra damage, and that's their skill card. And there's another character who's like, three, heal three HP to everyone. That's silly in a semi-cooperative experience. You want the characters to all feel like, I mean, who wants to be the monk if the person who does the most damage wins? I just realized I didn't give you context. In my head, in my head, I was suddenly referring to like MMOs and partying up to like have different, uh, you know, the holy trinity of damage, support, and tank, tank damage support. And so in my head, I went straight there, and I didn't really convey where my head was at. So going back a second, if you are in an MMO, MMO, MNO, if you are in an MMO and you are playing in a system which the most damage wins, who wants to be the monk or the tank? Nobody. That's the potential problem here. Because killing people, to be very clear, killing people is how you get the stuff you need, the various things. Where are the enemies? They were on this card, weren't they? They were on here. The enemies show you how much you get for them. Either way, we have uh, Otherworldly Machinery. Deal three damage to all targets. Heal three to everyone. Deal three damage to all targets. I want to play this game cooperatively. I want to play it cooperatively. Andre's Crossbow. Remove all enemies' passive skills in this battle. Unfading Memories. Players get three of those tokens. Just a bunch of skills over here. Albuston. We have Sword of the Morning. Any, number on, any numbers on red skill point cards in hand are treated as one. Now, 
yeah, I, again, even, I don't know if these are attached to specific characters or not. Enemy attacks, ooh, these are just enemy numbers. I don't know if these are specific, uh, attached to specific characters, but even if they're from a central draw deck, same problem exists. Why are you drawing the card that deals three damage to everyone, where damage is the thing that helps you win, and why am I damaging, why am I getting the card that heals three to everyone, which is what's keeping the party alive? So here are going to be the, uh, blue and red cards again these are going to be used for the various characters in some way one of these colors does more drawing cards or chaining or something like that but i have to look it up properly to figure that out and i'm not going to do that in a second because this is meant to be a unboxing not a rules overview now the tricky part that i did not account for is i just opened up two decks of cards in a game system that doesn't really give you places to store the cards i mean it does but like tucked in here which is not really a system so hold up while i grab two you know what no I was to say, hold up while I grab some baggies. I guess I can grab some baggies right now. Let's do that. Let's do it. We got a bunch of baggies. Courtes courtesy of my uh, Evidel unboxing, in fact. They had lots of extra baggies. Once you put it all in the collector's edition, I just have extra baggies from all the individual box sets. So now I will be able to put this back, fortunately, because otherwise we'd have a problem on our hands. And then we're going to go ahead and look at the miniatures and then put this all away and then uh, read that fairly short rule book. It looked fairly easy to dive into. It wasn't just short, but it looked, it looked accessible. That's the upside here. So we have that going for us. We're going to put all these gems into one bag. Also, by the way, I haven't used these yet, but I will say, I don't know whether there's a reason why these are different colors, but having white, light blue, and dark blue, if they have some meaning behind what they represent, I can't imagine that's the best. Again, like just look at this over here. We have three different colors in that bag, and it doesn't look like it. It looks like we have two. I mean, you can tell, but at a glance, at a glance. And so that, I hope, is something... That is not going to be an issue, but we'll see. And we have more. Oh, I forgot. There's more tokens in the bag. I'm going to mix together these greens and these reds because I don't like using 7,000 bags. And so I don't mind having two distinct tiles in a bag, especially if the bag is too small for those tiles, too big for those tiles. These can get their own bag because there's enough of these. And there may even have been more. There's more punch board stuff, which I'll deal with later. For right now, this is good enough. Let's remove these off the side. And let's go through the miniatures, which is the thing you're all here for, which is why 17 of you jumped here. Seven of you. It's Epic 7. Epic 17 arise. Jump straight here to see the rest. So, we got our bags. They'll go off to the side. We got our tokens which will go off to the side, our boxes. We have these, which we specifically have kept. And we're going to move these off to the side. And we'll show you the red bosses last because they're obviously the coolest. Let's go ahead and show you some of these people here because we got a bunch of things, including some bases for... Characters, I guess? Yeah, characters, because the characters all have the same same size base. So, here's going to be a character. These are these are actually pretty cool. I like the miniatures. The miniatures are great. That's the... I mean, it's not a problem that the miniatures are great. It's just sad that they're not, you know... I want the game to be good. I want the game to be good. I hope it's good. It looks fun. We'll see what happens. It looks fun, except with the caveat of, you know... Like, look at these miniatures. These miniatures are great. They could use, uh, what's it called? Textured bases. Nowadays, I think we're at a point where textured bases are becoming more and more the norm. We got, is this jerking? No, it looks it looks slow as far as how it turns. But yeah, texture bases more and more are becoming the norm. But to be fair, this was put out a while ago. So now this is the problem as well. I think these are supposed to be on these bases, meaning this character over here is supposed to be on this base. But this base is supposed to show the number, the health dial. So if you see over here, there's a little health tracker. The tricky part is that means in order to properly use these bases, your characters are not actually standing on the base they're standing like that a little off the base which is weird so they have oh they have specific characters i guess yeah but like over here you're putting your character kind of offset onto the base which is a very weird system a very very weird system like i don't know why this is something that i've already seen complained about and i would want to check it out because i didn't i almost didn't believe it but like this is legit this is legit in a bad way this is like the characters are not matching the size of the base is supposed to be tracking their health it's so bad. I mean, it doesn't make the game bad. But again, look here. This is how it has to be over here. And this is how it has to be over here to properly see the numbers. If you put it onto the base in any way, this is as far. This is me pushing it to the very edge. That's the numbers you can see. You can't see the numbers if it's on the base. You see? Look over here. That's matching the side. So you really have to offset the characters. And if I recall correctly, the uh, Kickstarter version came with stuff that's almost just as bad in a whole different way. So they managed to screw that up, which is not the most impressive. Again, miniatures look great, but the health trackers are really not great. And again, it's a solvable problem. This character looks like she's pregnant. I mean, I don't think it's meant to be pregnant, but looks like, look, uh, look, she's holding a little stomach, which is really just a ball over there. And then we got this character over here with his sword and his flowing cape. Very uh, Devil May Cry in the 
genre, which is, I guess, the genre thematically. I like the arc. Again, great miniatures. I like the arc of daggers here. Look at that arc. You see? The arc of flaming daggers. It's a very cool thing. That with a textured base could be absolutely cool. I can't even tell what's going on here. Is she missing a hand? No, her hand is over her chest, weirdly. That is a weird pose. That's like she's doing... That's... That, I'm going to show you that again. That I thought her arm was missing. Look at her arm. I don't know if you can see that. That is her arm over her chest. Which honestly, I mean, not to get too technical, but her chest does not need more weight on it. But, again, not my genre. Not my genre. We have these over here. I think the miniatures are great. I really do. It's just like there's a certain uh, side point where they move into being great, but also being uh, not great. Or subjectively not great. But like this guy over here. I like the uh, the first guy I showed show you with the giant axe. This guy, that's my favorite from the various heroes. And then we get to show you all the baddies because, again, these are cute things. We got some cute miniatures here. They had a campaign, didn't they? Farsight had another campaign, an area control game that I don't think it funded. I wonder what happened to Farsight. I wonder if they got, like, I don't know. I don't know. I hope they're okay. But we got this little frog, which is focusing. Look at that guy. He looks adorable. No problems there. We got this guy. Look at the little, little adorable rat that's going to knock you out. And then we got some tree peoples and some more peoples. We got peoples out, out the wazoo over here. These are all, we have multiple of these enemy sculpts. I'm just showing you them one at a time. I mean, I'm showing you one of each type, I mean. One of each type. Here we go, we got that guy. And then we got this guy over here, who's basically Groot. I mean, he's basically Groot. We got three of them. I kind of wish we had one of them, because three Groots is not as cool as one Groot. I mean, I guess it's three times the coolness, but it's not as unique. You want things to be unique. You ever heard about the whole uh, Magic the Gathering one ring card? Like, that thing is worth $2 million because it's unique. Imagine if they only printed one copy of every Magic card. That would make the entire set worth $2 million per card, which actually sounds like a lot, but honestly, that would probably be a downgrade from how much Magic is worth otherwise. That's an interesting question, actually. Now I'm intrigued. Look at this guy. Look at him. He's basically um, the thing from Fantastic Four. Now I'm kind of intrigued in the math. Here's a, here's a puzzle for you, okay? Not really a puzzle, just a question. I think this goes like that, and this goes like that. How many unique cards are there in a magic set? Okay, so in any given magic set, how many unique cards are there? This guy's not going in properly. And if you multiply that by 2 million, would the set be worth more or less than what magic is actually worth? This is not going back in. This is the way it's supposed to go here, I think, right? Or am I doing this wrong? This guy's supposed to go here? No, it's supposed to definitely... I think that worked. Okay. Ish. I think. Uh, anyways... The average value of, of Magic the Gathering, like, what's that worth? Meaning, if they, whenever they put out a new release, versus the, like, 416 cards they have in a set, times 2 million per card. Does Magic generate more than 800 million per set? I think it does, right? I think so. I could be wrong. Obviously, those production costs to take into account. Okay, I'm going to show you these in ranked in order from least to most cool. Okay, okay, I got it. Least to most cool. This one over here is, in my opinion, the least cool. And they're actually all cool, for the record. Oh, they're red. Oh, actually, this is not bad. This is picking up the red detail pretty decently. Red miniatures, in general, are always a little hard as far as what they capture. But that's boss number one, who is pretty cool, but not the most cool. Okay, then we have the second most cool, which is going to be her. I like her flaming scythe, which is why she got extra brownie points for uh, flaming scythe. Focus. So we go over here. Look at that. Look at that scythe. Look at the flames along the edges. The twirling robe. She looks like she can kill you and not lose any sleep over it. Also, textured base, which looks like, I mean, they all sort of have textured bases, but not entirely. It's a textured base adjacent, I'd say. Then from these two, this is the third most cool, okay? Or the second coolest, depending how you look at it. The second, the third, the third least cool, the second coolest. I guess that's how it works. This guy's cool. I like him. I like, it's a great sculpt. This really did a good job with the sculpts. And then lastly, Lastly, we have this guy who I think is the coolest because I think it's an excellent snakehead and it's got a person. So we have this one over here. Look at that. Look at that snake snakehead sculpt. Now, hopefully, this is actually a fun game. Hopefully. Because I think these are really excellent miniatures overall. Again, with the caveat around styling. But especially if you like the style even more so. I mean, I like them even without liking the style in general. And so that's definitely brownie points they get as far as um, doing a good job of that stuff. And time to put this all back in the box and hope for the best. Because we have this over here. This is a reboxing over here. But a reboxing with the knowledge that technically some stuff have come out and some things have been adjusted. I should probably put this on screen for you to actually see. Okay. We're going to put this in like this. 
We can put our deck of cards in here. I know it's technically the other way, but I'm mixing it around because I'm crazy like that. I'm going to punch these in, these in, these in, these in. I mean, they all have bags, so they don't even need that anymore. We're going to punch these over here. And the tricky part is we're going to have to like deal with the fact that this does not go on well at all. We're going to put these in over here. Not the best. This is like a command style uh, assembly, command style inserts, where you kind of just have to like, you know, it all fits when it's in the punch board. But then after you get out of the punch board, well, that's your problem. That is generally how these things feel, by the way. But it does genuinely feel like that for right now. But you know the good news is we kind of got it to fit. We have a rule book over here, which we'll deal with. And we have a box that won't go on 100%, but will go on most of the way. I forgot about this. I don't need that, but like the next person who gets this game, if it isn't for me, is going to want that. That is going to be Epic 7 Rise, the board game, or at least an unboxing of it. I'll be diving into this one soon enough. The box says... What player count? The box says 1 to... Okay. Okay. I haven't read the rules, but the box says it's a 1 to 4 player game. How could you have a semi-cooperative experience as a 1 to 4 player game? I will be reading the rules. I'll be diving in. Stay tuned for the review, because I am both simultaneously excited for a fun, good time of gathering abilities, rolling dice, and taking down baddies. And I'm also nervous for uh, possible mechanical aspects to the game that make it not for me. We'll see. In any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.